Hi, my name's Dave Adams, you're watching The Core Mechanic, and today we're looking at number 79 on Mike Selinker's list of 100 games you must absolutely, positively know how to play. Of course, we are looking at the classic Ticket to Ride. Hi, my name's Dave Adams, and I love playing games. At the 2015 PAX convention, one of my favourite game designers, Mike Selinker, presented his list of top 100 games you must absolutely, positively know how to play. The 100th game on the list was a challenge to play a game of my own design. With the desire to understand more about the hobby that I love so much, I've taken on that challenge to design a game, but first I need to learn as much as I can about game design. I'm going to start by playing as many of the games on Mike's list as possible. Join me as I learn more about the core mechanic. Tickets to Ride was designed by Alan R. Moon and published in 2004 by Days of Wonder. The game plays between 2 to 5 players in about 30 to 60 minutes, although I have known quite a few games to go longer than that. The game met with critical and financial success with over a million copies being printed. The game has been released with multiple versions for an international audience. Uh, it's got any number of expansions. It's received multiple awards, including in its year of release, receiving the Spiel des Jahres and the Meeple's Choice, among numerous others. This game is hugely successful, and every time it releases a new expansion, uh, when it's been released onto different platforms, including uh, iOS and Android, this game seems to get more, bigger and bigger audiences as it goes. This game is a monster in the gaming industry. So let's check out how it's played. The game takes place on this beautifully designed board that covers the United States and Canada. During each player's turn, they're going to be attempting to connect destinations by using these rail networks or tracks. As players score points during the game, they'll keep their score on the outside of the board. Crucial to scoring points are these destination cards, which each player receives three of at the start of the game and must keep at least one, as well as a handful of train cards. The rest of the train cards will be placed down and five will be turned over. This will be part of the playing deck that all players will be able to draw upon during the game. During a player's turn, they might take two cards directly from the top of the deck randomly, or take two seam cards of any colour, replacing them immediately from the top of the deck. Or alternatively, they can take one single wild card, which would immediately end their turn. Instead of drawing cards, the player may instead choose to use their trains to claim a track. They simply need to play the correct number of the right colour or any combination of wild cards to put their trains down and claim that track. During a two to three player game, only one track can be claimed, but in a four to six player game, the double tracks can be claimed by up to two players. As soon as a player is out of trains, all other players have one last turn before scoring, the person with the highest score wins. Ticket to Ride pulls together a few key mechanics which just seem to work really well together. And there's just enough of them to do their job uh, to contribute to the overall theme and the conceit of the game. It does have a rather light conceit, but I think that's because the game is a family friendly game. In fact, this game tends to get onto nearly every uh, gateway gamer list that's out there. To the point where just recently I've started to see get game lists for gateway games now including a caveat saying, of course, we're not including Carcassonne or Ticket to Ride simply because they're so prolific and we know that every list is going to contain them. And so they go on with their new top 10 list. But the fact that it's still acknowledged and the fact that people just assume it's going to be used has got to say a lot about how well received it is and how popular it is and just how successful it is as acting as a gateway game. And the reason I think this works so well as a gateway game is because these mechanics are so easily adopted by young and old, old gamers and brand new people to the hobby. Moon really tries to go for that mass appeal. And I think that's most evident by the fact that the two games he's had win the Spiel des Jahres have both been family-centered games. In fact, the first one to win back in 1998, Elfenland, was 
based on a previous or earlier design of his, a game that used to take four hours, he managed to scale it back down to an hour and managed to find a market, or at least a mass audience market, for that game. And of course, he won the Spiel des Jahres that year. And then in 2004, this very family-centered game is once again another winner and a huge success. Alan Moon himself regales stories about how his game appeals to mass audiences. It's one of his preferences when designing games. He really enjoys being able to target a game so that it can hit families and make families happy. He tells stories, his, and his favorite stories, in fact, include uh, some letters that he's shared in, in numerous interviews about people taking the game to their grandparents' place and their grandparents saying, next time you come, you must bring that train game. So his, his appeal and his design is focused on that mass audience. So they have to be simple. They have to be accessible. And when you think about the mechanics and how he uses them, then he's really thought through exactly how much information uh, his audience is able to cope with and how they make decisions. Now, Moon loves cards. He, it's his favorite mechanic. He wants to include cards in everything. The thing he loves about cards is he sums up by quoting Richard Borg, who talked about cards, the deck of cards being the greatest mechanic of all, because every player gets their hand thinking that they're going to get the hand that wins the game. And if they don't, well then the cards get shuffled up and they get redealt, and that whole excitement happens again. Moon loves using cards as part of any of his games and Ticket to Ride is no different. In terms of his mechanics, he uses drafting and track lane. Now, I don't know that track lane is specifically considered a mechanic yet, or whether it's got that acknowledgement. It might even be classified with area control, considering that once you've laid that track, it's now not accessible to other players, and also lane tracks can hinder other people's ability to, to get around the board. Uh, but Either way, it's commonly referred to as track lane, and so we're going to stick with that for the moment. So he's really brought it down to those two key mechanics where players are really left with very minimal choice in terms of what they're doing, but those choices are critical to the game. You're either drafting tickets to decide which cities you need to score between, or you're drafting cards to try and make tracks between those cities, or you're lying track which means trying to not only just find the shortest distance between those destinations, but sometimes that means navigating around other players or even trying to look for that elusive last 10 points with the longest track. The track lane mechanic, however, isn't a side part of the game. It really is integral. While drafting is perhaps for Moon the fun part, the track line is absolutely integral to winning the game. And it becomes a real point of tension. Can you draft the right cards? Are you making the right decisions? Do you take the two colors that you might need? Do you take the one, uh, the, the one wild card that could be anything that will definitely be able to be used? Do you draw two from the top and make it random? All really important choices, but so is the rush to get those cards down. In fact, the first player who runs out of cards cr triggers the end of the game. So being able to not only claim track fast enough, being able to find the right track, being able to get to your destination so that those victory points on those ticket cards don't become negatives, but actually contribute to your victory is really important. So both mechanics are essential. Both mechanics are integral and nothing feels like it's just there because they like it or, or because no one thought to take it out. Moon is really particular about that in his game design. In fact, he said in an interview that the, the art of game design is being able to get rid of everything until you have the most amount of fun in a box. Just being able to take out all the non-essential parts of the game. And that's perhaps why he doesn't, isn't appealing to hardcore gamers generally, or even why he doesn't want to make games for those gamers. He wants to make games which are simple and fun. One of the things I can take away from Moon's approach is that consideration of audience. Am I designing a game for gamers or am I designing a game for a mass audience? That becomes really important in terms of choosing which mechanics I choose and how I implement those mechanics. Moon has really chosen two key mechanics that work brilliantly together, but he's also scaled them back so that they're not convoluted. 
each player is making simple choices. They're not, they're not hitting this cognitive dissonance of being so overwrought with the information that they just don't know what to do with it. The choices, however, do have real impact on the game. So making the right choice is important. So there's real consequences to those decisions. And it's not a matter of, oh, well, I was making a lot of poor choices, but I still managed to get through with a win. That never happened. Happens in a, well, that doesn't happen in a Ticket to Ride game anyway. I think the genius here is that trying to really think through, not overcomplicating it, even if it is a game for gamers, not to overcomplicate those mechanics, not to try and just have stuff in there because you like it or you think it's important. Does it help the game? Does it move the game along? Does it contribute to telling the story of the game and engaging the player in what they're doing? Does it help the player with decision making? These things are really hard things to think through. Of course, the big challenge is always going to be scaling things back, taking stuff out. Because sometimes I know, even when I'm writing or when I'm working on other projects, I get really attached to good ideas. But sometimes those good ideas aren't the best ideas for what I'm doing. And so being able to be, have that critical eye, to listen to feedback, and of course doing a lot of game testing to discern, discern what is most essential in this game. I think Moon has done a wonderful job with providing a game that is well-rounded, has a lot of appeal, has good decision-making, has really great mechanics that just work brilliantly together. There's not a lot of negatives about this game, except if you're a huge game fanatic who just wants really tough, rigorous, war-like games or those sorts of things, clearly this game is not for you anyway. I don't think that's a negative, I just think that's about audience and about knowing your preferences. Well, thanks for watching. Always love to hear from you if you've got thoughts on good game mechanics or what makes Ticket to Ride a great and successful game. Put them in the comments section below. We look forward to hearing from you and seeing you next week. I'm Dave Adams. You've been watching The Core Mechanic. Until next time, see you later. Thanks for watching. We'd love to hear from you. What games rival Ticket to Ride in simplicity of mechanic design? Put your answers below. Thanks for watching.